This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. This is Minister Jerry Spencer from Bank Street Memorial Baptist Church in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, this is the day, brothers and sisters, that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And let us give God the thanksgiving that only he deserves this morning, that he deserves and only he, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so I want to thank everyone for uh, listening in this morning to our biblical study. Again, the mission of, of the adult Bible study ministry is to bring men and women to a saving knowledge of Jesus to Christ through the study and the teaching of his holy word. And so with that, let us go ahead and um, have a, open up with a word of prayer before we begin our study for this morning. So let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us to be here this day, to see another day. We thank you for waking us up this morning, Lord, and starting us on our way. Your word, O oh Lord, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so we ask and pray now, Heavenly Father, to quiet our hearts and let the Holy Spirit have his way in this ministry. May he take full control of this international Bible study ministry. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name, amen. Okay, we began our study this morning, brothers and sisters, in the book of the gospel according to Luke, the gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, 11 through 32. And so, our key verse for this morning will be coming from Luke chapter 15, verse 21. And it says this, it says, the son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And so our uh, study uh, title for this morning is the prodigal son. And I'm sure that uh, many of you have read this parable many times and have probably heard many different versions of it in your studies, um, your biblical studies. And so to this morning, I wanted to share with you a few words of this study as we continue to uh, study God's word that we may come to a, a better and saving knowledge of Jesus the Christ. And so next week, God's willing, our study will be coming from um, the book of uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 1 through 9. Now, um, again, I believe that this is uh, uh, the first Peter. That's an error. It should say Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. So I just want to... Uh, just want to clarify that. Our historical background, it says that in the 15th chapter of Luke, several tax collectors and sinners had come to hear Jesus' teaching. Also present were Pharisees and scribes who had complained, saying to the Savior, this man receives sinners and eats with them, of whom they did not associate with. And so this seems to imply, brothers and sisters, that before Jesus came into the world, the Pharisees and scribes had placed themselves above those whom they saw as unclean, with the tax collectors being among the worst of them. In other words, they did not associate with that, this class of people whom they call sinners, notwithstanding their own fallen condition. On this occasion, Jesus begins to speak to the people in parables. Before explaining the meaning of parables, however, we must understand that Jesus gives a reason why he spoke to the people in such manner. And so we read in Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 13, Jesus' explanation when the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? 
He answered and said to them, because it is it, it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So what we can infer from Jesus' statement is that parable, parables contain a, a form of mystery or the mysteries of the kingdom. And so as we uh, continue on with what, uh, what's being said this morning, Jesus says also, he says, for whoever has to him more will be given and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Jesus was saying that there will be those who will just hear but do not seek to understand further as opposed to those who will. That's what he's saying. Therefore, he says, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, he says, nor do they understand. Our Lord goes further by quoting the words of Isaiah, giving the reason why the people do not see they do not hear, nor do they understand, because for the hearts of this people have grown dull. These are the words of, of Isaiah. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. And so Jesus may have been referring to those, to these, uh, to those hearing his words and seeing his gospel, his his miracles, rather and still rejecting him. After seeing the miracles, after hearing his gospel, his words, they still rejected him. When the Pharisees and scribes had finished complaining, Jesus began to speak a series of parables, beginning with the explanation as to why he associated with tax collectors and sinners. And so we know from reading, uh, from reading Mark chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, that the Pharisees and scribes had complained once before regarding Jesus' association with sinners. And so the scripture says this, and when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, our Lord said, but sinners to repentance. At its core, brothers and sisters, biblical parables are meant to compare something familiar with an object or an experience to a truth about God. And his work. In other words, parables function on two levels, their literal reference and their spiritual implications. Jesus taught with parables to challenge his audience to consider what assumptions or attitudes of theirs were at odds with God's word or God's work. And we found it in John Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 15. Our Lord's answer to the Pharisees and scribes in Luke chapter 15 was the continuation of a series of parables that began in chapter 14, the previous chapter, all pointing to the same conclusion, however, and this is key. Jesus addresses the complaints of the Pharisees and scribes in Luke 15, 4, by saying to them, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does he uh, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, Jesus says, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes to comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them rejoice with me for i have found my sheep which was lost you see 
And so normally, friends, when a sheep has gone astray, this is a sheep, the whole flock will follow it. But here, our little friend has managed to detach himself from the flock. He wanders off through the wilderness. He nibbles on what grass he finds. And when he realizes that he is alone with his limited mental faculties, he cannot find his way back to the flock. If no one finds him, he will stay where he is or wander yet farther away and starve or become food for a predator. So in the parable, the shepherd seeks uh, until he finds him. <clears throat> and he gently lays him on his shoulders and carries him back to the flock. Now, this is critical. When you're listening, when you're, when you're reading the parables, you have to really look at everything that's being said. And in this particular case, he says that when he finds him, he gently lays him on his shoulder and carries him where? He carries him back to the flock. And please don't miss this, brothers and sisters. The sheep was already part of the fold. The sheep was already part of the fold. Jesus said this. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. This brings to mind the believer's relationship with the chief shepherd. Though sometimes the believer or the sheep in Christ will lose his way or find himself out of the will of the father, he is still a part of the flock and of the fold and belongs to the shepherd spoken of in John 10, 16. And so more broadly, However, it is, is that all are sinners, all are sinners, and all are, are lost, have lost their way until they come into the fold and become a part of the flock, whose great shepherd is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so although the parables of the lost sheep, uh, the lost coin, and the prodigal son all have the same meaning. The parable of the prodigal son goes far beyond the previous two parables in that the lost one is a person now, which makes him much more valuable than a coin or a sheep. So important that Jesus said in Luke chapter 15, verse seven, he says, I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And so our God, our creator, is persistent in seeking that which is lost. And when the sinner repents, there truly is rejoicing in heaven. And so this takes us to our study for this morning, brothers and sisters. We find in our lesson back on our lesson outline in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 and 12. Then he said, this is Jesus talking. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, father, give me my give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, so this third parable of chapter 15 is probably the most well-known and loved of all the parables our Lord has spoken. Its meaning, although similar to the, the, pre, the two previous parables, goes well beyond them in that it does not speak of an object or an animal, but of a man created in the image of God. Though some would say that he was a wild and rebellious son. But the word prodigal, brothers and sisters, the word prodigal does not speak of the rebellion of the younger son, but instead is associated with reckless waste and spending. That's the definition of prodigal in this case. In ancient Middle Eastern time, Children traditionally did not receive their father's inheritance until the father's death. 
according to Numbers chapter 7, verses 8 through 11. So by requesting his share of the inheritance, the youngest son was effectively saying, Father, I wish you were dead. Though our Lord does not describe the measure by which the father divided the inheritance based on the law of Moses, the oldest son would have received a double portion, according to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. And so I want you to keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that this is a parable. It is a parable. And the son's asking for his portion implies a, implied a great dishonor towards the father and showed a rebellious attitude toward the family. Now, the law of Moses prescribed harsh consequences for a son who displayed stubbornness and rebellion toward his family. <clears throat> we find, excuse me, we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 through 21. <clears throat> excuse me. And so, though the son's action is not as extreme as that found in Deuteronomy, in this parable, however, the father responds with mercy, love, and grace, and not with punishment, which makes this story so unforgettable, you see. He didn't seek retribution despite his son's rebellious request. And this was not the point of the parable, you see. However, it was <clears throat> the episode of the, of the eldest son in the parable that spoke to the Pharisees and the scribes who heard concerning the younger son. And in their minds, they're thinking, you are the man, which is a reference made to in Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7, when Nathan confronted David of his sin. And so the Pharisees and the scribe, scribes saw the young, younger son in the same light. And so in uh, verses 13 through 16, uh, Jesus says, And not many days after, the youngest son gathered all together. He journeyed to a far journey, a far country rather, and there wasted his possession with prodigal living. Prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. Now, the parables, parables are often told without the mentioning of names. This is how you can distinguish a parable from a true story that Jesus is, is talking about. The parable won't mention names, but, if, but the true stories will. Jesus wanted his, uh, his audience, however, he wanted his audience to keep their focus on the attitudes and actions of the son. That's what he wanted. And so in this parable, the younger son was given his portion of his inheritance. With money in hand, he journeys to a far land, the scripture tells us. And adding insult to injury, he ends up in Gentile territory. So we can assume that he was Jewish. The fact that he leaves nothing behind implies that he did not intend on returning. And so what we have thus, uh, thus foreseen is that not only did the son want nothing to do with his father, but further distanced himself by his departure to another country. And so I want you to remember, brothers and sisters, the purposes of the three parables, because they all have the same meaning. And the rejoicing of the lost coin that was found, the rejoicing of the lost sheep that was found, and now the departing son will himself become lost, thinking that there is better life and engaging in riotous living 
that and in time he will be found. Now think about this for a moment, friends. Think about this. When the son left his father, what was going, what, what was given to him was not lost through failed investments. Instead, he squandered it through undisciplined behavior, according to Luke chapter 15, verse 30. And so when it was all gone, shame upon shame began to pile up. One storm after another entered into his life. The son had brought disgrace to his father, family, uh, his family name through gluttonous and wild living, according to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 7. Now comes the storms, friends. The parable describes a famine which was severe in the land where the son had decided to live. With no family or other relatives there to call on, the son finds himself without money, which, he which would have helped him find a place during the storm. Hunger and homeless and in desperation, the son agrees to take on degrading work as a hired hand taking care of swine, which were considered unclean to the Jews according to the law of Moses in Leviticus chapter 11, verses 7 and 8. Hearing Jesus is telling of swine, his Jewish audience would have considered this job to be most humiliating and most demeaning. And because the citizens of the country's own swine, he is most likely in a Gentile, in Gentile uh, country of Gentiles. And because uh, the citizens of the country own swine, he is, uh, he is definitely in Gentile territory. But remember, brothers and sisters, just because our children may wander off and end up going through storms because of their own rebellion, they are not disowned because they stray. They, uh, they are not disowned because they stray. And so we must not forget this. Uh, it goes on to say that there will be storms in our lives because of rebellion, because we are out of the will of God. That does not mean that God does not, does not own us, does, that God has disowned us. It does not mean that. They still belong to the family of God. Jesus uses the three parables in a certain order. He does this for a reason. A coin is an inanimate object. A sheep, though being an animal, nonetheless has and have a brain, albeit with limited thinking capacity. Man, however, is of a much higher form of intelligence. Now the sheep, wanders because it's it's because it's part of the sheep uh it says that the sheep wanders but because it's part of the sheep fold the shepherd cares enough to go looking for it our lord focuses on the son's condition the son's condition the son suffered three levels of shame brothers and sisters the first was that he wasted his wealth the second was that he became a servant. And third, he took on a job feeding swine. Now, in the ears of the listeners, in Jesus' day listening to this parable, the son had received his just reward for his dishonorable acts, according to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 25. Oftentimes in life, we parents, you and I, might think the same way when our children go astray. So humiliated was the son that it wasn't enough that he had to care for the swine, but he lowered himself to eating the pods that the swine were eating. Now, imagine, but don't miss this. Now, imagine what Jesus' audience must have been thinking. For a Jewish son, 
life couldn't get any worse. Life could not get any worse. The coin was a lost object found by the woman. The sheep was an, was an animal with medical mental capacity, could not find its way back, was found by the shepherd. You see, the son, though lost, is about to do something very different, you see. He activates that part of the soul which is composed of will, intellect, and emotion. Will, intellect, and emotion. He activates that part of the soul that will change his life forever. And that's his will. And so in verses 17 through 19, he says this, Jesus says this, but when he came to himself, you see, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and before, uh, sinned against heaven, brother, and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. And if you notice, brothers and sisters, he uses the will. He says, I will arise. He says, and I will say to him, his father. But when he comes to himself, says it all, brothers and sisters. He came to himself. In this parable, the son now sees himself as lost. Without money, without friends, without family, and in a land of the Gentiles. It doesn't get any worse than this. All that was given him has been wasted, and he finds himself taking care of swine. When he left home, he thought that he would find something better, only to discover that the grass is not always greener on the other side, brothers and sisters. It's not. He had become lost in his way of thinking, and unlike a corn or a sheep, the son now comes to himself. He understands his condition. He becomes remorseful, ashamed, and humbled. He remembered what it was like to be home again. And home, brothers and sisters, was would, is where he would return. Humble and ready to say to his father what? Father, I have sinned against heaven and, and against you or before you. And so we can imagine that the father tried to convince his son to stay home. But the son, however, had decided that he knew what was best for him. That is so like our children once they become of age. And because he had wasted all his inheritance, abdicating his sonship, he was now willing to be, to be treated like one of his father's hired hands, hired servants. He says he is no longer worthy to be called a son. And so the second portion of our study takes us to Luke chapter 15, verses 20 and 21. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, the scripture says, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He's hungry, he's dirty, he has worn out clothes and shoes. The son makes his way across the foreign land to return to his father, brothers and sisters. 
having spotted his home from a distance. The son now rehearses what he's going to say over and over. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. With a stretch of the imagination, brothers and sisters, one could imagine the father coming out of the home one morning, looking out beyond his property and seeing the silhouette of a young man coming towards him. When a child of God has been drawn away into the world, if he or she returns, the Lord does not disown them, brothers and sisters, nor does the Lord reject them because they are still part of the family of God. They are still part of the fold and Christ is still our shepherd. And so listen to the words of this parable. When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The father's prayers, brothers and sisters, had been answered. As he runs to meet his son, not even giving him a chance, <clears throat> excuse me, to say his well-rehearsed speech. And so Jesus says of true believers, he says this, all that the father giveth me shall come to me and him that come to me, I will in no wise reject. That says it all. We are lost. But when we return to the Father, when we come to a knowledge, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, God does not reject us. He welcomes us. John chapter 6, verse 37. Our God does not, now our God does not force us to leave the fold. Now I'm talking to Christians now. Our God does not force us to leave the fold. <clears throat> nor does he force us to return. But because we belong to him, obstacles are put in our path to remind us of who we are and to whom we belong. And because of his love for his sheep, the Lord says to the wayward, return to me. But the Lord will never force us to do this, friends. Our final verse comes from verse verses 22 through 24. Luke chapter 15, verses 22 through 24. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Why? For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. And so if we keep in mind, brothers and sisters, if we keep in mind the meaning behind this parable, its conclusion speaks of God's mercy and grace and his accepting the repentant sin when he humbles himself, acknowledges his sin, and asks for forgiveness. So when reading parables, brothers and sisters, we must remember that a parable takes one, sometimes two points, and drives home its intended message. In the first part of this parable is the underlying truth that genuine repentance is met with genuine forgiveness. Genuine repentance is met with genuine forgiveness, brothers and sisters. Although having already repented in his heart, the son was ready to repeat the seriousness of his repentance to his father. But how interesting is it, 
brothers and sisters, that when the father sees his son returning, it wasn't his outward appearance that moved his father's heart. That wasn't it. It was the son's return that the father discerned his son's changed attitude and demeanor. The father saw the son's heart. He saw the son's humility. He saw the son coming to himself and understanding what he had done. So in this parable, friends, our Lord's audience of tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, and scribes remind them of memories of God's promise spoken of in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 18, and other passages in the, other, in the Old Testament that obeying God leads to life, but to rebel against him leads to destruction. For the sinners and the tax collectors who were hated by the Pharisees and scribes, this was profound in that the promise is one of renewed acceptance by God when they repented, you see. But for the Pharisees and the scribes, the word promise was to them a warning made even more explicit in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. And so we must understand, friends, that the Lord promised to be generous and patient. He gives us, he gives sinners space to repent. And for the repentant sinner, there is celebration with joy and gladness. The same points Jesus, it was the same point that Jesus makes uh, to the Pharisees and the scribes when he said in Luke chapter 15, verse 7, he says this, I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. The parable does not end just with just the father's uh, display of love, generosity and mercy towards his younger son. It doesn't end there. Jesus also focused on the anger of the older sons at how the father treated his brother who has squandered all that he had and is now coming home only to be treated like some hero, you see. But the parable's focus, brothers and sisters, is on mercy and can be sum, summarized by the father's response to his older brother's complaint or his older son's complaint. We had to celebrate, he said. Now, this is the son. This is the father talking to the older son. He says to the older son, son, we had to celebrate and be glad. Why? Because this brother of yours was lost and is now found. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we know that there are many who are lost in this world today. And we know, Heavenly Father, that it is only through the spreading of the gospel of Jesus the Christ that those who are lost may find their way to our Savior that those who are lost and who desires to be forgiven of their sins may hear the word of God, repent, believe, and receive Jesus as Savior. Only then, O oh Heavenly Father, will the lost be truly found. And so we give you the praise and the glory of this day, O oh Father. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, we praise you this day, O oh Lord, for all that you have done and will do in our lives. And we pray now that your word may go out and not return to you void, and that souls may hear and believe. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters, and have a blessed day in our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. <music>